So I want to tell you about my guest today, Dr. Kyle Gillette. Dr. Gillette, I heard him on multiple podcasts, including his own. And again, this is another guest where we resonate on so many different things regarding obesity and hormones that I wanted to have him on so that you can hear from him as well and see that it's not just me saying all of this. So let me tell you about Dr. Gillette first. He provides a holistic, individualized approach to his patients. His practice includes preventative medicine, aesthetics, sports medicine, hormone optimization, obstetrics, infertility, integrative medicine, and precision medicine, including genomics. He believes that each human is a unique creation that requires attention to their body, mind, and soul. He uses shared decision-making and evidence-based approach to treat his patients. He firmly believes food is medicine and exercise is medicine. And he describes the seven pillars of health that we're going to go into today. After we talk a lot about different hormones and therapies and SHBG, just a little bit more, some supplements, and then we'll get into exercise and intermittent fasting and diet and sleep and stress, sunlight, social, and spirit. Enjoy this podcast. So this is going to be a game changer for you, and you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And it might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. Okay, Dr. Kyle Gillette, thank you so much for joining me. I have, well, I reached out to you a couple of months ago because I've been listening to your podcast. I heard you on Huberman and you and I say so many of the same things. So I had heard you on your podcast. I heard you on Huberman and you and I say so many of the same things. I like to allow my audience to hear from someone other than me, because you know, I'm sure you, you run into this with your audience and your patients too. They hear you talk about the same thing all the time. And then they're like, oh, there she is talking shit on intermittent fasting again. Well, now you and I are going to talk shit on intermittent fasting because you're the first person that I have met in this space that agrees with me on intermittent fasting. So we're going to go down all kinds of rabbit holes here 
Can you first start off by telling the audience, how did you get into, because you are a conventionally trained MD, but you got into this regenerative medicine, personalized medicine. You, you got into helping people that are obese because that's rampant in the US. So tell me more about your story first. Absolutely. So like you mentioned, I'm an MD. I did my training at the University of Kansas and I'm dual board certified in family medicine and obesity medicine. And a lot of what I concentrate on is the very common things like metabolic syndrome, like hormone dysfunction in general, because that's going to be a very high yield intervention. You think about not only what has high mortality, aka what kills people, but what also has high morbidity, what affects people's quality of life. So from a pretty young age, I've known that I wanted to practice medicine and help people, but I, I kind of have an atypical background, I suppose. I was homeschooled and my degree in college was critical thinking. I really like mechanism of action and I like to be able to explain why something will happen, whether it is good or whether it is bad. So I've kind of tailored my education to suit those needs. And uh, I like to practice what I call individualized medicine, which is kind of the antithesis of algorithmic medicine. Yeah. And that's what people need, because as you and I see in our practices, you have people coming through the door, they've had the same tests run, they've been put on the same treatment protocol, whatever it is, usually told to eat less and exercise more, when it really could be an underlying issue like thyroid, like hormones, like insulin resistance that needs to be addressed in order for that person to progress. So you have to take a personalized approach these days. Yeah. One note on the practice of medicine and evidence-based medicine. Many people are familiar with the pyramid of evidence-based medicine. And at the top, you have systematic reviews, meta-analyses, then you have double-blinded randomized controlled trials. And then after that, you have um, both prospective and retrospective cohort studies. Then you have case control studies. And I'm belaboring the point just to show that expert evidence is at the very bottom of the pyramid after all of those things. So yes, practicing evidence-based medicine is immensely important, but not everybody will fit into that box. There is a lot of what I would call selection bias, which can be both good and bad. Um, for example, it happens in urology. Some people, if you walk into a urologist's office, you're more likely to have prostate cancer because you're complaining of symptoms which may be related. Yeah. And the same exact thing happens in our space as well. Oh yeah. The same thing definitely happens. And then that's another reason why I wanted you on here because I mad respect your ability to look into studies and dissect studies and really pull out what that is saying. So even though we might hear something about a supplement being fantastic for you, you really have to break down and how was that study performed? What was the, the, the mechanism that they were looking for? How did they weed out people? Because now we see things like the Women's Health Initiative study the most expensive, worst study ever done on this planet that left us in, in a fear-based mode. So I'm, I, I love that you dive into that and you have that knowledge too. Thank you. One thing I like to say about supplements is the only difference between a supplement and a medication in general is one is prescribed and one is not. They both have pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics, you can remember, is the drug's effect on the body. There's a, a D in dynamic as well. And then pharmacokinetics is how the, the body metabolizes it and excretes it. So it's important to know that that applies for both medications and supplements. A hundred percent, because I know you and I see people coming in our doors with bags and bags of supplements because they heard on the doctors or they read it on a forum that they should take X, Y, Z for their weight, for their thyroid. And it's not that simple and it's not that safe. To just be throwing a lot, because just like a pharmacist will look at the interactions of your medications, you have to be thinking about the interactions of all those supplements as well. Yeah, that's true. And often yeah. it is very helpful to have a pharmacist. I am fortunate to have a pharmacist that helps me full time with things like that. And of course, the pharmacist at pharmacies will help with that. The local individual at the GNC is probably not a PharmD and is right. probably not helping you with those interactions. Very true. Very true. All right, so getting into the meat of this discussion, I really want to get into 
kind of your area of expertise. So weight and obesity and weight loss resistance and how that all ties together, like thyroid hormones, everything. So in your experience and what you see, what, what is the main cause of a slow metabolism? Do we even have slow metabolism as we age, or is there something biologically going wrong in the body? That's kind of the debate. The 10,000 foot view of this question is, is aging pathology? Is it a disease to be aging? We know that it is certainly a disease to be obese. Even our government considers the obesity to be an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And we do know that it is certainly a pathology, at least an ICD-10 code, to undergo things like menopause or even adrenal pause. I think that personally, I don't consider all aging pathologic just because it, it is inevitable. You know, uh, I'm a Christian and I believe that taking really good care of your body is one of our most prominent or one of our most important goals here when it comes to our, like our physical health. I think emphasizing body, mind, and soul and the health of all three of those combined is also particularly important. And I think there's a lot of interplay, which um, many people agree to, but not to get off into that too much. But back to the question about like, is it pathologic to age? Because as you age, body fat will increase, lean body mass will decrease, and you'll become what we call normally, if you give enough time, sarcopenic and osteopenic. Sarcopenic is when you have low lean body mass, specifically low muscle mass. And um, osteopenic is when you have low bone mass. So those are kind of two types of mostly lean body mass. Yes, even adipose tissue does have some lean body mass, but given enough time, that's nearly inevitable. So one way you could look at it is everybody will develop metabolic syndrome and it's only a matter of time and you can prophylactically treat that. Of course, lifestyle measures are our best treatments anyway. So that's, I, I guess, the good news. The way I see it is the combination of low lean body mass and high body fat percentage will inevitably lead to metabolic syndrome in most people. And that is a combination of the genetic component. Um, obviously, like no one theory is perfect, but there is the, the efficient farmer theory that a lot of people have very efficient genes that tend to put on a lot of body fat and crave a lot of fat and sugar or foods with high caloric density, but not necessarily high nutrient density. And that is partly true. And then the other way to look at it is this is just the environment that we're put in. Yeah. And then with the environment coming in, so I'm going to kind of expand on what you just said. So you have the genetic component and you mentioned metabolic syndrome, but we also have that genetic component for autoimmune, Hashimoto's. And, and then on top of that, we know that as we age, our hormones are going to decline. So whether that's a direct correlation with metabolism, which I believe you and I think there's definitely a correlation with low hormones and the decline of metabolism. But with all of those factors mixed in, we can say that maybe it's not the aging or the years ticking by necessarily lowering your metabolism to where everyone can say, okay, well, I hit 40. So it's all, it's, it's just all going to be in the toilet now. I'm not going to burn an ounce of fat. No, it's not necessarily the aging and time ticking by, but what's going on in your body and what genes are starting to express themselves. Is autoimmune popping up? Did you go through things as your pregnancy, change of hormones, all of that that can turn on the autoimmune switch as well? Yeah. In many cases, it's death by a thousand needles. There's not one specific injury that has caused it. In some cases, it's death by a thousand daggers, a little bit more than needles. Yeah, But that, that is certainly the case. One series of studies, which I think was fairly well done, that is quite interesting is regarding the phenomenon of people who eat whatever they want and just don't gain weight or the unusually skinny population. Mm -hmm. And they found two things were true in this population. The first one is not surprising. Compared to the average individual, they tended to underestimate the amount of calories they burned relative to the average individual. And they tended to overestimate how much calories they consumed. So they actually consumed less than they thought. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, they intook less calories. But the second part of that is 
obviously that was somewhat related to the first, but they tended to have much higher levels of free thyroid hormones as well. They did not look at sex hormones as a secondary endpoint, but that is a particularly interesting study, which I've podcasted on before. That is interesting because well, we're going to tie in calories, caloric restriction, energy deficit. We're going to, we're going to get there. But what's interesting is because we tend to look at those free thyroid hormones in our patient population, because that's a marker of, is something going on with your metabolism? Obviously, if free T3 is down, if reverse T3 is up, a person is going to have a slower metabolism, but then we have to bring in, which we're going to get to the lifestyle component as well. And it all has to work together, has to work together. So in your practice, when you're dealing with thyroid patients, you had mentioned even in, in some of our notes back and forth that you see the kind of the non-fat, the skinny thyroid patient. And I, I will see that every so often, the, the thyroid patient that doesn't have the weight problem, they have all the other things, the fatigue, the hair loss, the constipation, but they don't have the weight problem. Would it tie back to that study then? And could we say it's because of what they're eating and what they think that they're eating and their energy output? It might to some degree. Often in a population like that, they just tend to have lower binding globulins that bind thyroid hormone. So each hormone has a binding globulin, especially sterile-based hormones, and the thyroid hormone is no different. One interesting fact that I do think is clinically significant and is kind of like, a, I think, a clinical pearl for many, uh, both patients and clinicians, is that if you are on an androgen, whether exogenous, or if you just have better than average endogenous androgen production, that will increase your ratio of free thyroid hormone to total thyroid hormone. Conversely, if you are estrogen dominant, um, or if you are taking exogenous estrogen, including synthetic estrogens, that will increase your thyroxine binding globulin, or TBG, and decrease your free thyroid hormones. Some individuals have, oh, an extreme case of this would be like NCCAH, or non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, where they have much higher than levels of DHEA, which is a weak androgen, which is adrenally produced, a small gland above the kidneys. And these individuals might be more likely to be in the skinny but hypothyroid population. So if I'm unpacking that, what you just said for the listeners, if you have basically adequate amounts of androgen, i.e. testosterone, when your levels are optimal, not just normal, then you are naturally going to have better free thyroid hormone production by your own thyroid gland, correct? Not necessarily better production, but increased free thyroid hormones. Some people are familiar with like total T4, total T3 versus free T3, free T4. Yep. If your thyroid is only capable of producing up to a, a certain threshold of total T3 or total T4, let's say this is the level 100, but you're taking a estrogen, bioidentical or synthetic, doesn't really matter. Yep. That's going to increase the protein that binds that up. So your level of free thyroid hormone will be relatively lower, even at the same level as total. So you won't get as much conversion. You won't get as much intracellular activation of the receptor. And then you won't have as much gene transcription. So you won't have the positive benefit, even though your thyroid hormone is making the exact same level. Mm -hmm. This is often why during states of high estrogen, like pregnancy, it is more difficult to get over that threshold. For example, let's say you have a bit of subclinical hypothyroidism, which is now known as euthyroid six syndrome. Mm -hmm. During pregnancy, usually HCG, which molecule for molecule looks very similar to TSH. It actually binds the TSH receptor relatively weakly. That's binding the TSH receptor all the time. The levels are extremely high during the first trimester. You're just not gonna get over that threshold. And then concurrently with high estrogen, you're also going to have very low levels of free thyroid hormones. That's why uh, often during or right after pregnancy is the incidence of hypothyroidism that's clinically significant. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. I always see that. It was, it was after my first kid. It was after my second kid that just all hell broke loose in my body and my body's rebelling against me. So I hear that quite often. And doesn't that also 
just even going through, like I mentioned earlier, going through something like pregnancy or any kind of hormonal change, doesn't that flip that Hashimoto switch to the on position as well. Like you said, decreasing conversion. So we'll see reverse T3 go up potentially, and then increasing the binding globulins to the free hormones. So that's happening independent of turning on the Hashimoto switch. Yeah. It's kind of a perfect storm for developing hypothyroidism. On top of that, you have high levels of growth agonism. You're in a very anabolic state as well, and you're increasing your caloric intake. So that too, right. Yeah. It's a perfect storm for sure. Right. Okay. So I said, I had a kind of a plan for what I want to ask you about, but who knows where it's going to go. So we opened the binding globulin door. So I'm going to go into SHBG. Now I have one podcast where I talk about it, but it is just, it's so interesting when you really start to look at SHBG and what it does and what it binds to, and is it bad and is it good? So I really want your take First of all, the big question that I get, and I just tell them, go listen to my podcast on SHBG. So now tell them to listen to this one. What are the main causes of elevated SHBG outside of someone taking? We know if they're taking exogenous testosterone, we know if they're on T3, that's going to increase it. But what else is, I'm seeing a ton of elevated SHBG, male and female. SHBG is sex hormone binding globulin. It's the protein that binds all androgens and estrogens. A lot of different sterile hormones can weakly bind other sterile hormones binding globulins. For example, there's one for glucocorticoids. I call it cortisol binding globulin. I think it's called corticotropin, which binds cortisone and cortisol. But anyway, SHBG is for androgens and estrogens. The main androgen is testosterone. The most well-known estrogen, of course, is estradiol. It more strongly binds androgens than estrogens. So if you have a higher SHBG, you become estrogen dominant at the tissue level just from the high SHBG. There's several feedback mechanisms at play. As you mentioned, taking medication can affect it. Taking thyroid medication will increase SHBG in most cases. Taking things like metformin might also increase SHBG, but SHBG is produced by the liver. So its half-life is about one week. So even if you're doing something once a week, it can increase SHBG. When estrogens bind the estradiol alpha receptor in the liver, then that is going to increase production of SHBG and actually platelets as well, which the liver also produces. The more strongly this binds the estradiol alpha receptor in the liver, especially during what we call first pass metabolism, the more it's related to, well, one, elevated SHBG, but also blood clots, partly due to its action on platelets, partly due to its action as an estrogen. Not to get off on too much of a tangent, the insulin receptor also decreases the production of SHBG. So things like intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, hypoinsulinemic diets can increase SHBG quite a bit. So there very well is such a thing as a hypoinsulinemic state where someone might actually benefit from more healthy sources of carbohydrate or even fat that produces an insulin response. Insulin has a very short half-life. It has several downstream effects. For example, it's effects on SHBG that could potentially be beneficial. That's, I think the best way to look at it is various actions of hormones like insulin and estrogens on the liver. Androgens in the same way. It's a similar mechanism of action to insulin of decreasing SHBG synthesis. So that's why it's important. We mentioned intermittent fasting earlier. Sometimes it can be helpful. And sometimes you want to increase SHBG. Things that are very strong binders of the androgen receptor, like SARMs, can precipitously decrease SHBG. And crash it, I've seen SHBGs of one, two, three. There's definitely a balance. And in many cases, the dose makes the poison. Absolutely. So it's kind of like that Goldilocks. We don't want we don't want too little. We don't want too much. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you my pattern because this is one situation where I'm just going to argue and I could be wrong. So definitely like, correct me if I am, but one pattern where a slightly elevated SHBG might be beneficial. I take exogenous testosterone. One would look at my testosterone and their jaw would drop and you would think I had pellets because I'm hitting around 300 but my DHT is elevated, as is my SHBG. 
I do not have any androgenic effects. I don't get acne. I don't get facial hair. I, I don't have any of that. And this is, I mean, I'm, I'm from bodybuilding background, right? So I know what women have done to their bodies with exogenous testosterone and, and abusing it. Never went down that path. Now I'm using it obviously because I'm 48. I need hormone replacement. So I must, and I want you to get into the androgen receptors as well. But in my case, would you say that me having a high SHBG isn't so bad because it's mainly binding to the DHT and I'm still getting the benefits of my total and free testosterone being high? Yeah, in general, yes, definitely. SHBG is kind of one of the three main variables that you look at, not only in females, but also in males when you're thinking about the dosing of androgen replacement therapy. So you're also thinking about the density of the androgen receptor in the cytoplasm. It's affected by what we call heat shock proteins. And some things, including just genetics, can affect the density of the androgen receptor. Mm -hmm. And some people just tend to have more dense concentration of androgen receptor in the cytoplasm of a cell, for example, a hair follicle cell or the cells of the larynx. In addition to that, there's something called a CAG repeat. They're called trinucleotide repeats. And androgen receptors have this trinucleotide repeat phenomenon, depending on the level of trinucleotide repeats. By the way, two other diseases that kind of mimic this are Huntington's disease and fragile X syndrome. If you tend to be an individual, whether you're female or male, and you have more CAG repeats, then you are going to have a lower likelihood of side effects from too much androgen. We call this virilization in women. And then the other caveat to that is that there is, it's on the X chromosome. So females have two different CAG repeats copy. The average is about 18. So if you're someone and both of your X chromosomes have 25, then you're much less likely to have those side effects. Whereas if you're someone and one and or two of your copies have, for example, 15 repeats, then you're much more likely to have those. The last interesting thing, and then I'll stop monologuing for so long, is that if you have PCOS, there's two different organ systems that tend to always activate the hypersensitive androgen receptor. For example, if you have one copy with 25 and one copy with 15, in your skin and in your ovaries, the copy with 15 is almost for sure active much more than 50% of the time, which is what you would think it would be. Okay. So we would have to do a genetic test to find this out. Is that part of the, how you talk about your testing for the androgen receptor sensitivity? Is that part of genetics test or is there a separate test that we can do? You can do both. You can get full genome sequencing and find your CAG repeat. It's not a single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP, which is what most people think of a general test like 23andMe. So 23andMe raw data will not have this in it. Mm -hmm. There's also an individual test that people can order. Usually I don't order unless I'm really trying to push things into kind of like an optimal or borderline higher, like at the top end of the optimal range, Mm -hmm. because usually you can tell as many people have based on if they develop that effect or not. Okay. So what will you use if, if we have to lower SHBG? I've heard you talk about Toncatalli or long jet fruit. I've heard you talk about the benefits of boron. What else will you use? Well, wh- first of all, what would you use to lower SHBG if that is indeed the case that we need to, and, and we find that it's binding to the testosterone that someone needs and the estrogen that someone needs? And doesn't it also bind to T3 slightly as well? Yes arguably not clinically significantly, especially compared to thyroxine binding globulin. Mm -hmm. One of SHBG's main effect on T3 is that if you lower SHBG, your free androgen index is higher, which thus decreases your thyroxine binding globulin, which thus increases. And this is why you need a picture for a lot of these things. But anyway, so it will definitely increase free T3 if you lower your SHBG. Okay. So mostly secondary effect. Uh, yeah, we got off on a little bit of a rabbit trail there. Um, I know. Sorry. I know. I never know where it's going to go, but I wanted to ask about that. This was specifically the free T3 because I knew some, it was affected by elevated SHBG for sure. Now we can go into the, what do you like to use to decrease it? 
My favorite way is just incorporating more frequent meals, often with more carbohydrates, some foods that are slightly higher glycemic, not necessarily even carbs or sugar, and then timing that around when you exercise. My favorite way to do it is a relatively large meal after exercise and sometimes a meal before exercise as well. Oh, um, we, okay. We already mentioned boron and tongkat. Mm -hmm. Good rule of thumb is unless your SHBG is over 100, then tongkat or uricominones, uripeptides, you're probably not going to have a significant effect on your SHBG. Mm -hmm. They work on similar steroidogenesis enzymes that insulin and IGF-1 do. And then as far as boron, if you tend to have lower baseline levels of boron, then it might help more. If you're already taking a multivitamin with some boron, soils, especially in this country, are relatively depletes of boron. So uh, it's just like anything else. If you're at a lower baseline level, it will help more. If you give the average person boron, it helps a little bit, but it's somewhat temporary. And then feedback mechanisms kind of counteract that effect in a longer term scenario. When you're saying eating before a workout, what if you have that perfect storm person patient that is also insulin resistant? So we're trying not to spike their insulin. We want to get a growth hormone response. So if they're eating before they're working out, they're basically just tapping into the glucose they just gave themselves for the workout instead of their own fat stores. And then they load it with a meal afterwards, thus decreasing their natural testosterone increase and growth hormone increase that they get from the workout. So how do you balance like the what to do to get the most bang for your buck if you're looking to be just lean and in shape and fit and healthy? I try to assess the degree of insulin resistance. Most often, I'd say around 90% of the time, uh, insulin resistance is going to correlate relatively well with SHBG level. It's rare to see someone, especially that's like not trying to increase their SHBG with significant insulin resistance or PCOS to have a high SHBG. That being said, diabetics do have high SHBGs for multiple reasons. For example, a diabetic that does not produce any insulin is very likely to have a high SHBG. Again, because insulin is not going to be binding that insulin receptor, glucose might be very high. A1C might be 10. Perhaps that individual needs something like insulin. <laughs> Uh, my favorite peptide, maybe they also need an androgen. So in some cases, androgen replacement therapy is a great way. If it is obviously clinically indicated, it's a fantastic way to lower SHBG. Okay. Beautiful. Speaking of, okay, we, we could go down three different paths with what you just said. So I'm going down this one first, androgen replacement. What is your optimal testosterone for women? Most of my listeners are women. We're going to give some love to the guys too, but what is your optimal total and free testosterone for women? Yeah. So a lot of this depends on the women and a lot of it depends on how androgen dominant they are. The first checkbox for an optimal testosterone is free of symptoms of low testosterone, which is somewhat subjective. Many women say they have no symptoms at all, but they might have a symptom that they just haven't noticed an insidious mm -hmm. symptom, if you will. Yeah. The second one is uh, using the right assay. So in general, the gold standard is looked at as equilibrium ultrafiltration or equilibrium dialysis. Whereas under a testosterone level of around 100 nanograms per deciliter, the Roche ECLAs or other amino assays are not very accurate and they can be much, much lower or much, much higher. The scatter plot of like the odds range is really high. LCMS, which is liquid chromatography with tandem mass spec, I believe. But anyway, that's kind of in between and it's decent if you expect kind of an, a normal level of testosterone. For premenopausal females, I like to check around the time of ovulation, which does kind of get complicated because you're thinking, well, you check a an LH to FSH ratio day three to five, and then you right. check a testosterone and androgens day 13, and then you check a progestogens day 21, 22. Yeah. So <laughs> right. Sometimes you just check it and then assess that it will be slightly higher when it's at its higher range. So for individuals like that, then you're looking at a pretty wide range of normal. I would say 20-ish would be the very bottom that would be with a very low SHBG. For example, with someone with PCOS, 
and uh, tends to get a lot of side effects from excess androgens. Mm -hmm. Whereas the top range, I would look at a lot of Olympic athletes that have what's called hyperthecosis, which isn't necessarily a pathology. That's where the theca cells just endogenously produce a lot and they produce up to 200 or 300. Yeah, and they're getting banned from competing just because they have a naturally, people think that they're taking exogenous testosterone and they're not, that's what they're actually producing. Yeah, that is pretty messed up. But yeah, individuals certainly naturally produce that much. It's just rare. Most individuals fall somewhere between about 25 and 100 for total testosterone in women. So you would not consider if someone came back with a, a serum level of a, and, and I'm not, I can't get specific in terms of what pathway they went down in that serum level. Like, did they do the mass spec? Did they do everything that you just said? Just on the blood work. People are listening. They're looking at their labs. Their serum total testosterone, let's say, is actually getting flagged on those labs. They're 80, they're 90, they're 100, they're 120. You would not consider that high, quote unquote. You wouldn't try to reduce their androgens. You would look at it in context of their symptoms, right? Which is how we should all do it. But I'm just asking that just to make that point. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you look at their estrogens and progestogens as well. but mostly look at symptoms. So do you like something other than blood? Do you like saliva, dried urine, or do you go for the serum? In most cases, I start with serum testing. So I start with blood tests. Occasionally, I will use salivary tests or dried urine tests, but almost always in concert with serum testing. Serum testing takes into account both total and free hormones, where when you metabolize your hormones you are going to metabolize hormones that are not bound to binding molecules like SHBG. So if you're someone who has an extremely high SHBG, for better or for worse, usually for better, it's correlated with longevity. But if you are one of those individuals and say you get a salivary testing, then your androgen indices could look lower than they actually are. Okay. So bottom line, maybe do it all. I did a Dutch test as well. And again, I'm taking exogenous injectable testosterone therapy and subcutaneously. And it showed no testosterone whatsoever on the Dutch test, the dried urine metabolite. So you kind of have to piecemeal it together because then when I got the serum, then I saw the, and just like you said, it was the elevated SHBG, elevated DHT, elevated free and total testosterone. So that makes sense why it's not showing up on the Dutch. Yep. The more elevated your SHBG, the lower your indices will look on the Dutch test and conversely as well. So you might have an individual with an SHBG of nine, a uh, female, perhaps a PCOS, and their Dutch test looks like they have extremely high testosterone and DHT despite uh, relatively normal or low normal levels. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's perfect. Another thing you said earlier was regarding well, metformin increasing SHBG and just insulin resistance in and of itself. So I want to get your take on the insulin sensitizing glucose disposal agents. A lot of talk now on the semaglutide and the terzepatide and Manjaro. We got Ozempic and practitioners are prescribing that, which I am not against because I can't, I think it can be very beneficial, but these can also be anti-androgenic as well. What are your take on those insulin sensitizing, well, supplements and medications and peptides that we can add in? As far as the insulin sensitizing options, I try to separate them into agents that only act in the periphery and agents that are going to have multiple mechanisms of action, but one of them would be an incretin. So incretins, basically the way to think about them is they do many things. They might suppress your appetite. They might help sensitize different receptors that uptake glucose. They're renaming a lot of the receptors now. They're renaming everything. So they renamed some clinical hypothyroidism. They're renaming GLUT2 and GLUT4 receptors. Anyway, this incretin effect helps your body use the insulin it has better, and it helps it be more efficient with its secretion. So you think about your beta cells in your pancreas. Your pancreas is, of course, a endocrine and exocrine organ. The endocrine organs are mainly the alpha cells and the beta cells. And the beta cells produce insulin and amylin. 
So if you're a type one diabetic, or if you just have kind of, I consider end stage type two diabetes, you no longer produce these things. Whereas your alpha cells produce glucagon and they also produce GLP-1. GLP-1s produce in other areas as well. But all these things work together and you want to preserve the function of your beta cell. So even if you don't need insulin, and even if you're not diabetic, you might have poor beta cell function. And that's one thing that GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide are particularly good at is preserving this function. There's even studies that will give people these medications for a period of time. They stop taking them. And even after they've stopped taking them for a while, then their beta cells are still functioning better. It's called the legacy effect. And then in terms of weight loss, like long-term weight loss, let's say someone is using a semaglutide for the short term just to kind of spur on that, that weight loss that is necessary because we don't want them to be obese. We don't want them to be frustrated. As you mentioned in the very beginning, this is just a huge mental burden as well as a physical burden to carry around excess weight that is just not coming off even after incorporating diet and lifestyle. So we add in the, the semaglutide, the manjaro, and is there any downsides to that? Of course, you know, contraindications aside, uh, medullary thyroid cancer, nothing like that, which are all the contraindications for those, those peptides. But if someone were to use it as like a biohacking protocol to help with that weight loss, and then they do stop and maybe they go on a once a month, again, just for a once a month injection, just for the biohacking aspect, are there any downsides to that? There are a few downsides, which are not yet listed as black box warnings. Um, one of the ones that they fairly recently added is something called cholestasis. Just think about it as sludge that builds up in the hepatobiliary system. So the different tubes and ducts that come from your pancreas, your liver, and also your gallbladder mm -hmm. do not uh, push things along or function quite as well. There's something called intrahepatic circulation, which many people are familiar with because of bilirubin. But basically, you can excrete it into your gut and then reabsorb it again, and it goes back into your systemic circulation. The same thing can happen to estrogen. One of the ways that estrogen is metabolized more than androgens is glucuronidation. So they can both go through the ubiquitin system, and they can both be sulfated, but they can be glucuronidated and then marked for excretion, put into the gut, and then reabsorbed. And this is one of the reasons why things like semaglutide that can slow the peristalsis of the gut or slow the movement mm -hmm. are related to the reabsorption of estrogen and perhaps, and we'll know that they're related to gallstones. So kind of a, a classic protocol would be someone who's previously estrogen dominant is to get some of that excess body fat off to help fix the estrogen dominance. But then in the process of doing so has um, hyperestrogenism and maybe even a gallbladder attack and has to get their gallbladder out. Yeah, not not a good scenario just from wanting to lose some weight. So <laughs> now you had mentioned that your favorite peptide is insulin. So I know many of the listeners are thinking, but wait, I'm trying to get my insulin down because insulin's the fat storage hormone. Now, when I talk about it, I would say we can't demonize it, right? We need it for life. If you were a type one diabetic, you would need insulin or you're gonna die. I mean, period, end of story. So where can we, how can we reshape our view of insulin and why is insulin your favorite peptide? The insulin that you have, you want to use as well as possible. So insulin, of course, other than its life-saving properties, also acts on the steroidogenesis cascade, as we briefly mentioned, many similar enzymes that uh, Uri peptides from uh, supplements like Tonkat Ali will work on. This is one of the reasons why you see individuals who are in a significant caloric deficit have low testosterone. For example, a natural bodybuilder would be a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You will not see many natural bodybuilders stepping on stage with a normal testosterone level. And insulin is one of these, one of those reasons. Again, just to kind of go back to the fitness industry and bodybuilding, insulin is a very anabolic hormone and making use of it to retain your lean body mass is going to help prevent you from building up body fat in the long run. So that's the, one of the best tools that we have against it. But the key is getting to a point where you're not insulin resistant and where your body is not overproducing insulin. 
Right. No, I remember the guys that would, they would use insulin to get ready for a show, but a couple of them ended up becoming diabetic and insulin dependent diabetic because of the abuse of the insulin. So Mm -hmm. it really is about getting your body to utilize your own properly. And like you said, not, not to overproduce it in the first place. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, just it's like the Goldilocks, right? Again, we want to we want to get that perfect balance of insulin, not too low. And I do see very low insulin, and I'll see low insulin and low leptin on people's labs, and I'm always wondering if they're in that starvation mode because you know when you're trying to lose weight, especially if it's thyroid related, hormone related, nothing is working. You're doing the perfect diet, you're doing everything perfectly but almost to excess because you're like, oh, every time I eat, I'm putting on 10 pounds. So they just reduce, 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 reduce to the point where there's not enough insulin on board and leptin looks like you're deficient in that as well. Do you see that in your practice too? Absolutely. In almost all cases, the dose makes the poison. Yep, exactly. Exactly. All right. I'm going, I'm I'm going into the intermittent fasting thing because listen, Kyle, (laughs) You're one of the only people I have talked about the benefits of intermittent fasting. I know you're on my, my good friend and, and colleagues podcast, Cynthia Thurlow, who obviously is an intermittent fasting expert, but it's not always good in all cases. And I love that you mentioned that. And we're just going to keep going back and forth as to the why, because so many of, I know my patients will come to me, same thing as I just described. You know, the thyroid's in the tank. We have to optimize that. We have to address hormones. They're they're dieting or over dieting just to get the damn weight off. And then they throw in the intermittent fasting because they heard and read and all the things that will help with weight loss. And while it does help to lower insulin and make someone more insulin sensitive, there's some downsides to it. So I'm going to hand that over to you now. Yeah, with intermittent fasting, There are health reasons to intermittent fast, but I don't recommend that the average person does because when you intermittent fast, again, as we mentioned earlier, you're going to have less insulin signaling. It could potentially affect, especially if you're a very lean individual, it could certainly affect your steroidogenesis capability and potential. The other thing is when you intermittent fast just to lose weight, and it's not something that you like doing, perhaps you hate doing it. Well, and it could bring up orthorexic tendencies, which is kind of like disordered eating. You almost become scared of food or borderline averse to food. Yep. And then the other thing is, and this was a recent study, I think they followed people for 12 or 16 weeks, which is a relatively short time in the context of obesity medicine. And they lost weight very slightly faster initially than the other groups. And then they kind of uh, evened off and their weights were equitable at the end of the study. And to me, that is more of a concern than a benefit. If you're waiting, losing weight faster, it is nice from a mental standpoint to see that there is relatively more success. But when you lose weight on average, about one third of it is in lean body mass. And if there is like one takeaway from weight loss, I mean, it's great that we have all these different tools like GLP-1 receptor agonist. It makes it easier to actually lose the weight working with a quality healthcare provider, of course, but keeping it off, you want to lose as little lean body mass as possible. And for that intermittent fasting might not be the great choice. And the decrease in protein intake that I see when people intermittent fast, they simply can't get in the required amount of protein to feed that lean muscle mass that they want to keep on to avoid the sarcopenia, to just even have that metabolically active tissue, i.e. muscle on their body, I see a huge reduction in protein intake as well. Yeah, you would certainly expect a reduction in protein intake. And even if you do intake all of the protein in grams, of course, protein is no different than any other macronutrient. The quality matters and also the absorption matters. So you would need to very carefully work with your uh, doctors and dietitians regarding protein sources that can be absorbed very slowly over a period of time. And you'd have to look at things like leucine content and methionine content. And also you'd need to time it relatively well as well, just to make sure that you are getting that protein in, like you mentioned. So could intermittent fasting, if someone implements it because they, they swear to God, it's working and it's fantastic for them. Would, and they have an elevated SHBG. Well, number one, 
the intermittent fasting is probably contributing to that. Number two, can they, can they overcome that by eating maybe every hour or every two hours during their eating window? So if they do that 16, eight and they have an eight, I mean, that would be a lot of food in eight hours, but can they override that increase in SHBG by adding in multiple, multiple, multiple mini meals and snacks in their window? It's possible, but it's also not guaranteed. So the only way to know is to trial. And it might be reasonable to try that. And it might also be reasonable to have, for example, two different fasting windows, but then you're not really intermittent fasting. That's true. <laughs> yeah, then you're not really, yeah. Benefits aside, you're not really getting in all the benefits from it. One of the things that you mentioned on your podcast, and you have, I want to say, it's is it six pillars that you look at when you're working with patients, correct? And one of the, you know, not sexy ones outside, we... Hormone optimization, thyroid optimization, that's all sexy, right? But when we talk about lifestyle, and I do this on my podcast too, I, we, we got to keep bringing it up because we got to keep bringing people back to the lifestyle component. So they're not just relying on, give me supplements, give me medications, give me hormones, give me all this stuff over here, and then not doing the lifestyle component over here. So I'm going to tie this back to what you said earlier about people who are naturally thinner, they tend to think that they're eating more calories. Yes, I'm saying calories, more calories and expending more than the average person. So now we come back to people that are trying to lose weight. Do you have them track ever? Do you ever find that your patients think that they're eating? I'm just going to throw out a number, not that this is right, but think that they're eating 1400 calories. But then they start tracking and they're eating 2,400 calories or 1,800 calories, something like that. Yeah. Calorie tracking and many other different types of tracking are on the prescription pads that I like to write to patients or on the list of advice that I write. It's pretty common to see this. Even doctors and dietitians tend to over, tend to consume at least 10% more calories than they actually uh, are tracking. And this is of when we track calories. So they underestimate the caloric consumption. The average individual does that much more. However, that being said, tends to not be something that I overemphasize, right. not because it isn't true, but because it can lead to a breakdown of the physician patient report. Yeah. And I mean, I've always, I've kind of avoided tracking with myself and my, because I used to track obviously in bodybuilding and fit, fitness figure, I tracked everything and it does kind of create that orthorexia, that obsessive compulsive, almost behavior where you're overthinking about what's going in your mouth. But I have to tell you for the first time I started on a new app that's out and I started tracking. Oh my goodness. I mean, I am consuming way more, which on the one hand, it tells me that my body can handle more than I think because I'm not gaining. I'm very much in a nice steady maintain maintenance mode, which I have been in for years. So, but, oh, wow. It was very, very eye-opening to see what I was actually taking in. And then I thought to myself, well, my patients that are struggling with weight, I'm thinking we might have to track a little bit because what they're telling me, oh, I'm good. I'm getting in hundred grams of protein and I'm staying under 60 grams of car or whatever their plan is. It might not be the case at all. Yeah, I have at least half a dozen different variables and I have people choose or I help them choose or just choose for them at least three of these different variables. So a number of meals per day is actually one of them. And of course, calories is one and macronutrients is one. Eating speed is one. Size of food yeah. is one. Different, like the number of plates or the number of portions per meals is one. Breaks during the meals is another one. Calories is still definitely my favorite one to track, but uh, a lot of times, again, leading to that selection bias, people have already tracked calories so many times. Yeah. They're just so happy and refreshed and like the science and mindset is very strong and they are willing to track six other things, but not calories and <laughs> they can have good success. And that's true. I mean, you don't really need to track the calories. I mean, we could figure out the calories based on the macros, but if you just look at your macros, and you don't even look at that calorie line, you're still, I mean, us as practitioners can get an idea of how many calories you're taking in just based on your macros. All right, Kyle, you have, no, I'm sorry, you have seven pillars of health. 
We're not going to touch on all of them, but I do want to, I'm going to read them off and I do want to touch on the last one. So obviously exercise diet, which we just talked about. I have talked about sleep and stress and the social aspect and sunlight being so important spirit. So I love this as one of the pillars of health. I'm Christian as well. I mean, it's just been, whether you term it religion, Christianity, faith, spirituality, whatever it is, it's always been a strong component of my life. And I think too many people shy away from talking about this in public, on podcasts, but I I want your take on why this is so, it's a key, like you said, it's a pillar in having optimal health and getting to where you want to be. Yeah, it is particularly important. And a lot of clinicians learn this as they do their postgraduate training. They might see someone who is in an end of life care situation, or perhaps they're on comfort care. And a lot of times the spiritual health, or at least just the metaphysical realm, what they achieved in their life, that is the most important thing to them. And if that is not well, then it will affect their physical and mental health in that situation. But the same is true throughout all of your life. So even if you're not a spiritual person, you can definitely, everyone can appreciate their metaphysical self. The way I explain this sometimes is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it's another pyramid Mm -hmm. and you have your physical and mental needs at the bottom of the pyramid. And we're fortunate that in uh, this country and most developed countries, that top of the pyramid, which is self-actualization, that's kind of each person's way of being happy and finding meaning in life. And that's what I consider your spiritual self. And it's so, yeah, it's so important. It's it just, and like you said, it's, it's almost a base. It's what's holding the rest of you up. And without that, what crumbles? If you don't have a strong foundation, if you don't have a strong base, then everything that you're building on top of that it's just going to fall down. It's just going to fall down. So how do you help? Do you incorporate in meditation? How do you help your patients kind of get that, that pillar, which some of you are like, Oh, I don't know. That's not been a part of my life growing up. Maybe my parents didn't introduce that into, into my life. So how do you bring that in? Often patients bring it up as well. Occasionally for the right patient, I will pray with my patient. Mm -hmm. I think prayer can be kind of a form of meditation or perhaps mindfulness. Um, Sometimes I recommend the mindfulness book, especially for healthcare providers. It's called Heal Thyself, I believe by uh, Saki Santorelli. And it has to do with your metaphysical self as well. And of course, your mental health and how you can look at healing yourself as great practice for caring for the metaphysical self or the spiritual self of each patient. This is pretty well known in other areas of medicine, for example, if someone, if you have a healthcare provider and they've been through a very similar thing, for example, maybe a endocrinologist that's also a type one diabetic or a pediatrician and an OB doctor that has delivered their own babies and had their own young children and all the illnesses that come with it. And that's just another example of a way that you can kind of both heal yourself and have better empathy at the same time. I love that so much. So I I don't want to let you go until we give a little bit of love to the men out there. We talked about female testosterone. I am very much intrigued. And like I said, I've heard you talk about this on your podcast a ton. I'm very much intrigued by Fidoja, Turkesterone. I mean, we talked about Tonkat Ali, but Fidoja, Turkesterone, uh, beta ectosterone. How, How can guys use this? Because as we know, guys really get the short end of the stick in terms of testosterone because of that huge lab value standard range. And you have to have two morning, actually low, like flag low testosterone levels as a man to even get looked at sideways and told that you have low T and here you go, here's some TRT. What's the potential that guys can use these, I wanna call them new, they're just getting kind of more spotlighted recently these newer products like Fidoja and and Tricesterone that's on the market to actually help them raise their testosterone level naturally, so to speak, through supplementation. Fidoja is a supplement that is used a lot in traditional African medicine. Uh, For example, I think they use it for many hundreds of years in Zambia, both for fertility 
and for libido as well. It does appear to be an LH mimetic and an LH um, receptor sensitizer. It is a relatively new supplement in developed countries supplement industry. So uh, it does also work on enzymatic enzymes like alkaline phosphatase and GGT, which is gamma glutamyl transferase. So often I track these for patients that are on it. A good candidate for that might be someone who is already ready to try something else. They're having symptoms, perhaps they're borderline deficient, and they might also have a low luteinizing hormone or LH. Of note, I guess HCG also binds the LH receptor. We mentioned earlier that it binds the TSH receptor. Mm-hmm. Ectosteroids bind the beta estradiol receptor. So both beta ectosterone and terkesterone. Mm-hmm. And these are thought of as plant steroids and bug steroids. They come from both sources. But the beta estradiol receptor is one of the estradiol receptors. It's often in muscle tissue. It's actually in many areas of the body as well, but it is the one that's not related to breast cancer risk and not related to SHBG or platelet production. A good candidate for that is someone who has an extremely low estrogen who otherwise couldn't be on other estrogens. So the best candidate for that is, for example, a female with breast cancer that is on an aromatase inhibitor that has to keep estrogens very low. In cases of individuals that have medium or high estrogens, it likely does not have any clinically significant effect. So the more rock bottom your estradiol, the potentially better candidate you are for ectosteroids. One other thing I'll say that since we're also talking about males here is if you're a male and you have a rock bottom estradiol, that is a big problem that is very related to cardiovascular disease risk. So in general, you actually want your estradiol to be as high as possible, just with a, a concurrently high testosterone. Okay. So where do you like, I'm glad you brought this up. I literally just met with a new patient today, male, and we were having, he's very educated. So we were having this back and forth conversation about where the estradiol should land. Now I have seen some males with an estradiol of 200. That to me is not cool. We do want to kind of lower that. So where do you like to see male estradiol levels come in? Estradiol is in picograms per milliliter. And if it is that high, again, in general, if estradiol is over about 80 or so picograms per mil, you can use an amino assay like a Roche ECLAA to measure it. But a ratio of one to three of free testosterone to total estradiol, this is assuming a relatively normal SHBG. That's what you would look at. So if you're looking at your free testosterone, if you have a free testosterone of 30 nanograms per deciliter, then I am certainly okay with the estradiol up to around 90. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like that ratio. That's something that everybody can go by. Absolutely. Thanks. Kyle, Dr. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your wisdom and sharing your experience. Like I said, I just love to hear from experts. And if we agree on everything, great. If we don't, great. But I, I like to have experts on here just even saying some things that I've already said in a different way to really drive home the point. So if people want to find you, where can, I I know you have a podcast, which is fantastic. So we put that link in the show notes as well, but where can people find you? Thank you. My podcast is called Gillette Health Podcast. And if they go to Gillette Health, spell it however you like, it'll take you to my website. But my main hub is Instagram where I am Kyle Gillette in And we'll put all the links in the show notes too. So, Kyle, I appreciate you being on here. Thank you once again. And we'll definitely have you back on. My pleasure. Take care.